Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Ha, Associate Curator of Contemporary Art at the National Museum of Asian Art. Welcome to this evening's program, Join the Curator, Artist Talk with Michael Jew. This webinar is offered by the studio, the museum's contemporary art virtual space. I'm pleased to introduce our guest, Michael Jew. Through innovative engagement with diverse media and technology, Michael operates at the intersection of art and science to encourage interdisciplinary reflection on transformation, perception, and the natural environment. He holds a Master of Fine Arts from the Yale School of Art and a BFA from the Washington University in St. Louis. A prolific artist, his works can be found in the collections of numerous museums, including the Guggenheim, Whitney, and Museum of Modern Art in New York, as well as the Walker Museum in Minneapolis and the Moderna Museum in Stockholm, among others. Michael's projects have been exhibited worldwide, most recently at the Hawaii Triennial, which just closed a couple of weeks ago. I'm just going to start with a brief overview of um, a handful of works. Let's see if we can get this started here. No stranger to the National Museum of Asian Art, uh, Michael was the 2012 recipient of the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. As a fellow, he studied specimens at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, focusing in particular on the iconic red-crowned crane that winters in the highly protected demilitarized zone that divides North and South Korea. Using a combination of advanced digital reproduction tools and early uh, photographic imaging techniques using silver nitrate, Michael created Collective, a stunning large scale work exhibited in 2016, along with a sculpture visualizing the crane's migration patterns. Collective is part of a series of works incorporating the unique reflective properties of silver in the form of silver nitrate applied through a lengthy process of, as he put it, coaxing the images through chemical reactions and leaving behind traces. Here are just a few examples that resulted from his research on the natural environment and the complex social history of Sapelo Island off the coast of Georgia in the United States. Here it was uh, shown alongside images, uh, shown alongside the images of the petrified trees was the sculpture that you see hopefully on the right, uh, titled That Which Just Evaporates All Around Us, a speaker is encased in a frozen cube of sawdust. Field recordings from the island slowly increase in volume as temperature and sound vibrations cause the block to disintegrate during the course of the exhibition. In two other examples seen here, prologue and marble strata room, large marble slabs from Danby Quarry in Vermont, the largest such quarry in the world, Michael explores tectonic boundaries and uh, geological manifestations of time. Veins and seams appear like landscape paintings held aloft or braced by steel supports. Surfaces of silver nitrate along with steel and refrigeration simultaneously heightens, heighten one's awareness of space and its materiality. And finally, in an ongoing project, Michael takes a different approach to bringing the um, sort of unpredictability of organic and creative processes with the science of digital algorithms and market behavior. In 2021, Michael teamed up with digital artist Daniel Krigorushko for the NFT project titled Organic Growth Crystal Reef. This dynamic work is composed of over 10,300 unique digital crystals available as NFTs. The resulting digital reefscape evolves with each transaction. Consumers become co-creators as the individual units, um, starting with seeds, uh, cause the digital artwork to grow each time a unit is resold. And I hope I've got that correct, Michael. Uh, ultimately, the units will become part of a communal physical artwork that will take the form of the crystal reef. Here we see um, a, a pre-visualization, um, as he calls it, of one potential form that it could take in space. These are just a very few examples that hopefully provide a sense of some of the 
ideas and motivations that shape Michael's wide ranging practice. In particular, his attention to site specificity and a deep engagement with the physical and social dimensions of place, his interest in processes of transformation, even entropy, and a continual exploration of the nature of the object and our relationship to it. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Michael, who joins us on the heels of the 2022 Hawaii Triennial, which I just mentioned. Uh, he will walk us through his research and the production of his immersive installation, including Fossil Bed, a work that invites its audience to recline on an authentic fossil slab. Michael, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. Hi, uh, thank you. Carol, for that wonderful introduction, and thanks to the uh, National Museum of Asian Art for this invitation to speak with um, you about what I've been up to lately, and perhaps a bit of its relationship to my other work and where it comes from. Um, when I was first invited to uh, participate in the 2022 uh, Hawaii Triennial, um, I was particularly um, interested in uh, the, as you mentioned, uh, site, but more than site, um, as a kind of bed of research and inspiration and re uh, site of contemplation and response uh, for a sculptural practice, um, I'm interested uh, in the idea of place. And I think site, in a way, implies an anonymity, but also a kind of physiography of, of, of what one is looking at and, and where one is. But I think place relates to the overlay of human histories and human presences um, that make up that uh, location and make up the engagement and the kind of uh, relevance and uh, um, you know, form uh, the basis for my um, inquiry. Again, Hawaii as a site and a, a place on the globe um, of incredible, um, you know, uh, geologic uh, identity, place of uh, volcanic in origin, where um, literally the kind of geologic past is continually making the present is something incredibly um, fascinating to me. When I was uh, again invited to the Triennial um, and this exhibition, which uh, the edition of which was called the Pacific Century, uh, curated by um, Melissa Chu. Iwako Tezuka and uh, Drew Kahuna Kahu Nina Roderick. Um, I was invited to come as um, several of the artists involved in more site specific installations uh, and visit uh, the islands, uh, more in particular Oahu, as a starting point um, to understand where it is we'd be working. I was immediately struck by the incredible. Um, um, place that this island has in a larger system, the kind of incredibly rich, uh, lush uh, land and everything that's uh, it's, uh, kind of grown and spawned, but it more, most provocatively, its relationship to, can you move the next side, slide, please? Its relationship also to the sea and with perhaps um, society and everyone else in between the kind of culture. And just to see the uh, incredible you know, drama and pageantry of the water cycle happening every day alone, the kind of uptake of evaporating water into the mountains, watching it, the mist form and you know, replete with the kind of trademark flying rainbows was absolutely incredible uh, in this kind of uh, really lush environment. Um, and seeing those kind of cycles makes one think every day uh, of, of a kind of a much larger macro scale and uh, smaller scales in our places in a larger environment. Um, the other thing I became interested in, obviously, um, could you, uh, next slide, please, uh, was this kind of uh, biodiversity and organic forms. So on a large scale um, of geologic time, there's this incredible kind of pageantry between um, distant time and close time. And, in formation and on a, on a kind of more immediate and volatile level um, that happened day to day, the, the water cycle 
you know, creating fresh water from the ocean, cycling through the land, nourishing all of this kind of biodiversity and returning um, over and over in a constant cycle is, is fascinating. And yet on the ground, this, um, again, uh, biodiversity uh, of plants and animals uh, uh, was, was quite stunning. Um, another of the, next slide please. Uh, the things that really struck me was the idea, again, as I mentioned, of place, and in particular, the very kind of urgent nature of, uh, I think, the Hawaiian identity. And I became very interested in the um, history and the history of place and the relationship of Hawaii's particularly um, unique position, both in the globe, as indicated by the show's premise, but also unique place in, you know, uh, history, contemporary um, human and American history and global history. Um, uh, among the sites we were allowed to visit um, that kind of exemplified this for me were the uh, um, Alani Palace. And this is the palace of, uh, next slide please, interior of the palace of King David Kalakaua, Kalakaua um, who in a sense in the 19th century was the a king who uh, really set out to um, open Hawaii's profile and was one of the first the dignitaries to actually um, circumnavigate the globe um, in a kind of a probably an unknown fact and an incredible proponent of technology, which really interests me. And I, I you know, struck me as a really interesting character poise between the um, kind of um, historic roots of the Hawaiian people and seeing a, a kind of contemporary horizon ahead and trying to kind of bridge that gap, not only in you know, kind of policy and interest in adopting art forms and technology, but also in physically moving on, on a path across the globe. Um, the next slide, please. The other person that figured very highly in this um, kind of early research was uh, Queen Lilio Kalani, who was actually the second queen after his uh, the first queen, um, David Kalakaua's uh, wife, Queen Kapiolani, was um, uh, did, actually died and passed away, and um, Liu Kalani um, uh, took the throne. Well, she was present during the um, kind of changeover of Hawaii and annexation of Hawaii by uh, the United States and in the course of that process was um, put under house arrest in the palace uh, for uh, kind of inciting a potential sedition by a, a very manufactured um, kind of claim of uh, sedition. So next slide, please. And so under house arrest, she was an incre incredibly creative and productive spirit and that really interested me. Um, on an image here of us visiting uh, along with Melissa Chu, I think you'll see on the left there, um, uh, the Hirshhorn uh, director. Um, one of the quilts, the many quilts and art objects and you know, creative kind of uh, output that Queen Lili Wakalani um, produced while well inside um, and trapped inside the prison. Um, next slide, please. The quilts contain different kinds of messages and, and um, it's an interesting kind of uh, amalgam of, of sources and, um, and almost coded kind of messages. Um, next slide, please. Other things that the queen produced were um, translations. She was an avid singer and musician and so um, compositions, um, songwriting, uh, music, all, all sorts of, of, of creative output. Um, translations that were really important to the Hawaiian people from the native language to English, uh, many of which um, she accomplished first. Uh, among the incredible uh, number of stories inside of the, uh, the history of the, uh, as, and through the lens of the palace alone um, of the Hawaiian people in that time um, was the, um, the an object that really struck me, which um, is depicted here in this slide, which is the, um, the bed of King Kalakaua. And that bed is actually a surrogate here because the bed that the king had was along with many other items uh, sold off when during the imprisonment and house arrest of uh, Queen Lilua Kalani and is missing to this day. Um, 
most notable among many other objects that are potentially missing, many of which have been recovered. But the idea that this bed is still out there um, you know, struck me as a kind of interesting portal in which to kind of you know, investigate an object from the past and its relevance to the present. Um, next slide, please. Um, the other site that was so significant to me that I was um, asked to engage with and invited to engage with was the um, uh, Bishop Museum in Honolulu. And the um, Bishop Museum um, was, was an incredible research um, and resource um, site and place for uh, the Hawaiian people and um, many others. I was really struck by the fact that this is a ostensibly a kind of science and natural history museum that uh, one that perhaps has a foothold in using the past as a lens to really look at and understand contemporary Hawaiian um, identity and is a really amazing bridge between you know, past and present. Um, here we are looking at some traditional textiles. Next slide, please. Along with Marcaz Mazan and uh, Josh Tengen, artists, um, specimens that are holding many natural history specimens. This is a um, marine biological specimen called a feather star or a crinoid, which um, you'll see uh, has relevance later. Moving on, please. Next up, sea urchin specimens. Continue, please. And so in looking at these specimens, and this is a traditional kappa cloth actually uh, made with a, a wooden print. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that, that you can um, note the sea urchin forms that are on it. Uh, the um, textile itself is made from a processed and beaten uh, mulberry pulp. Next slide, please. You know, going through all of these forms at the, at the uh, museum um, really inspired uh, the idea of looking at you know, form as one entry point and kind of you know, being inspired by form and as one, one point of exploration of how to respond to this incredibly complex place and, and how for me to um, kind of engage my work in a, in a discussion with some of these interests uh, and access points that I found. Next slide, please. So continuing on, specimens were collected. Here is a uh, table of specimens of coral collected at a former Japanese internment camp on Sand Island Beach in Oahu. Next slide, please. Um, Coral specimens. Continue, please. Another form, um, Queen Kapiolani's uh, necklace, one of the famous necklaces of uh, hers that is, um, was on tour and um, often and um, continued to be for quite a while from her kind of rather spectacular uh, Victorian jewelry collection. That form also um, kind of had a chord, struck a chord. So a number of the things that were being viewed and that I researched always, you know, in these kind of site visits as a sculptor, as a kind of creative visual uh, person, um, you know, are anchor points for me in terms of the making practice, which is part of my, um, big part of my practice alongside the research and some of the more kind of either conceptual or um, performative gestures. Next slide, please. Um, my here we are with my collaborators, Alchemy Verse. Uh, this show, I think um, it, it struck me really early on that this show would be a lot to tackle, very, very complex. And in, in, in as much, you know, a, a place and a show, a site that um, embodied so many of the things I was interested in and so many of the things that could not, in my mind, be told either necessarily by text or through potentially sculpture itself to me, physical object or image um, seemed evident. I, I felt we needed to really have something that was experiential and enter Alchemy Verse, a creative sound duo uh, 
actually visual arts duo that um, kind of really works heavily with sound and something that I've worked up a little bit in the past and had a great interest in. And so I thought maybe by including perspectives and slightly um, you know, um, augmenting our approaches into a, uh, an arena that would be more experiential um, to work alongside the visual um, would really potentially yield um, exciting results. Here we are working on um, the initial um, parts of responding to the corals by making, next slide please. Next slide. A uh, coral version. So uh, uh, again, in a response to form, um, one of the interests to me was to perhaps respond to the necklace form, which I did not get to see in person um, as it was um, deep in storage or perhaps on tour. I um, responded by collecting um, all of these corals and with, among the hundreds of corals specimens we collected along Sand Island Beach, um, it was interesting to try to pull out of them a silhouette of this necklace to kind of conjure from this um, eroded marine organism, its exoskeletons, the kind of shadow, if you will, of this piece of jewelry from the past um, itself, a reflection of a kind of international or cosmopolitan identity. And, um, but I thought that that coral and all of its history, um, you know, how could it convey, um, you know, the complexity of, of the task and convey uh, the idea of a, of a place. And so um, this coral necklace is outfitted with um, what's called bone conductors. And I think you can see uh, in the slide at the center, one of the, the wirings that some of the first bone conductors were attaching. So this coral necklace um, was given uh, a series of bone conductors attached to it, which basically operate in such a way as to uh, create a frequency that makes the object generate sound itself. So no speakers are used, but the bone conductors themselves actually vibrate the coral um, to sonify the object. And um, in this case, six bone conductors were used to give voice to six coral pieces um, uh, to a recording that we made uh, by a, a local artist of the Hawaiian creation narrative or chant, the Kumalipo, as recorded by a local Hawaiian artist. Uh, this translation in particular was the translation generated by uh, Queen Lilibo Kalani for the Hawaiian people and for the rest of the world while under arrest. Uh, six detuned, digitally detuned voices are um, vibrated through the bone conductors so that the coral necklace itself speaks, so to speak. No pun intended. Can you go to the next slide, please? Here we are giving it sound, giving it kind of uh, life, so to speak. Next. And it was installed um, at the top of a balcony parapet overlooking the rest of my installation. Uh, so it kind of presided as a glowing halo of sorts um, and a sound source. Next. And in addition to the um, you know, idea of following form and generating you know, form to its to uh, where we could to where I could take it in response to um, you know what I was interested in uh, in my subject matter for the, the triennial uh, is sound as you can kind of see that sound exploration um, that was has emerged from the form exploration um, you know I wanted to extend that further and so we started recording all around the island here we are recording some of the historic bunkers around the uh, um, internment camp, um, you know, built during World War II. And we generated all of these microphones and particularly, um, you know, Yixuan uh, Xiao and Bi Chang Liang uh, Alchemy Verse um, 
you know, created all of these microphones that would record um, interior spaces and subsonic frequencies underground, as well as um, custom mics for other applications. Um, next slide, please. Recording the ocean, recording the beach. Next slide. Um, recording local artist Josh Tengen um, uh, re reciting again both the translation of the Kumulipo, uh, the Hawaiian creation narrative and chant, um, as well as the um, Hawaiian, native Hawaiian version of this uh, very sacred text and important chant. Um, I, I didn't um, want to use any of the, the sound, particular um, sound recordings we did um, in order to kind of you know, preserve some of the integrity of it as a chant, but um, the content essentially, um, you know, of the first uh, stanza of a series of stanzas and groupings uh, in the chant, uh, refers to the you know beginning of life, the you know, kind of um, self awareness, the gaining of self awareness of objects and organisms and people that make up the earth. And uh, this really struck me as an interesting and I mean a very contemporary and timeless idea that there is existence and the kind of concept of of awareness and self awareness and awakening as being the kind of operating principle of creation uh, really really struck a chord with me. Um, Next, please. Recording um, um, parts of reused architecture and parts of salvage. Another thing that's interesting to me is the kind of you know, alongside of the change in site, which is, I guess, vis a vis the volcanic activity and geologic tumult that goes on, is the kind of um, um, tumult and change that occurs in the urban sphere and the social, uh, cultural sphere. And so, um, you know, visiting salvage sites became important to me to look for architectural salvage. And this, these particular um, you know, objects um, were very um, kind of inspiring in a, in a sense as well, because I wanted to look at land, but um, which uh, according to Hawaiian tradition is sacred and should not be moved or transported from its, its site. And um, one thing that struck me about these concrete pavers, next slide please, um, was that in many ways they were a cast of the land wherever the cement was poured, but on the other side, the surface that was kind of smoothed for, for human use and was actually you know, completely anonymous and paved and uh, kind of obliterated the landscape underneath. So we took some of these pavers um, as uh, potential material. Next slide, please. Um, as, as mentioned, this kind of uh, said volcanic activity and movement in the land um, was uh, undeniable. And so I felt I had to respond to um, the erupting, currently erupting um, volcanic activity in Kilauea. Here it is on, at night, just actually last week when I was uh, on island, up in the uh, big island. Next. So we set out to record um, the earth itself at this important juncture. And we wanted something that to go out and be experiential in some sense to record that um, seemed important to us. So you can see Xuan and Bichang as tiny dots at the rim of that crater edge. Next. And we used um, microphones placed upon um, connected lava flows to try to capture the subsonic frequency of the erupting volcano and get a, a tremor. In this case, not so much for the sound, uh, so much as for the feeling and the kind of frequency. Next. So following the pathway of sound, um, kind of merged with form, we uh, placed a subwoofer inside of this pedestal of cast and built land and um, built environment um, inside the base, playing the subsonic frequency of the earth. Um, you could feel it in your feet, but you could not so much hear it, but you could feel it in your feet and actually vibrating in your body. Uh, next, please. And placed it inside of a existing vitrine 
um, from the museum's collection. So we wanted to use a lot of the lenses and frameworks that are existing and that are kind of, um, I guess, um, have been traditional, um, in this case, 19th century you know, frame, frameworks and lenses and models to look at something that's present and, and not containable. Next slide, please. So uh, again, the, the idea of the bed was, was so um, you know, important to me and striking that I felt, you know, how would we respond sculpturally to this, to this story? And so um, the surrogate bed itself um, was something I thought I should potentially look for. And, and um, in embarking on a kind of search for that profile, um, located a 19th century half tester bed. Um, in England, Northern England somewhere, that um, was actually built in the same year that uh, King Kalakaua did his world tour. So this Victorian half-tester bed, which is actually the fragments, the footboard and the half-tester canopy that's above, um, were actually produced the same year and may have been in the same city at the same place and time as the king himself. And that really was of interest to me as a material identity and a portal potentially. Um, and so I used that as a springboard to create this um, uh, bed from uh, and, and um, fabricate the missing parts with uh, Sapelo wood and later went on an island with Ipe, Hawaiian Ipe wood as a kind of support structure. Next slide, please. And, you know, if, if given this framework and this new lens, um, you know, was a starting point, uh, it was important to me to consider, well, what would be the interface? What would be the mattress, so to speak, that the human would interface with, that we would interface with in order to kind of understand or get any sense at all uh, of, of relating to this uh, framework? this framework in a way, this bed that was my version of one of the vitrines potentially in, in, a, muse in a museum or frame around an image. Um, and the centerpiece that it struck me was uh, potentially something that um, I had already been working with in my studio. This is a, a shot from a, an installation that I did um, in uh, or was working on uh, in my studio uh, back in 2000. Um, 12, uh, the images you see inside of this uh, kind of grouping of flats um, panels are, are actually crinoid fossils or fossils of uh, sea lilies. And these fossils come from a Silurian era about 500 million years ago or so. And so for the last 15 year, uh, years, uh, I've been collecting these uh, fossil plates um, when I heard from a uh, friend in the kind of fossil uh, network and world that this uh, fossil bed had been being depleted or diminished and it really um, stayed with me as something that um, could potentially be a landscape that was, you know, uncontestable. Is, is it possible to imagine a landscape, you know, a 500 million years is something that um, wouldn't be, would be beyond contest. Of course, when lifted as objects and, and um, you know, mined and brought to the surface, they become contested as objects, which, you know, again, kind of heightened its importance to me. So these, um, I thought perhaps we could collect um, these fossil plates from this particular one, one particular GPS coordinate in the North African desert of Erfurt uh, near the Algerian border. Um, what if we could collect these sea lily plates and make a flower bed? Um, from 400 to 500 million years ago that people could actually walk across and encounter haptically and try to kind of, you know, relate in a different way to, to a time scale and a, a geologic specimen that, in any way, is so a human. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, this kind of mock-ups of installation were in the studio in 2012 when Hurricane Sandy hit. Next slide, please. And all of these as I kayaked in, you know, uh, the next day, uh, we're under three feet of water. As I looked over the side of the kayak, you know, kind of looking for objects that have been destroyed, I took a note that underneath the surface of the ocean again, that had flooded the studio were these were these crinoids, and the idea that they were returned to one unified ocean, perhaps after so many so much time, so much travel. Um, it was absolutely kind of, you know, chilling to me and, and quite exciting. 
Next slide, please. So I knew I had to use them in, in another way. And so um, jumping ahead to the triennial, I thought, well, what if this could serve as that interface plate? Next slide. And so we decided, or I decided to use this as the mattress of this bed, the fossil bed, so to speak. And alongside of the sound and experiential kind of mandate that we set forth for ourselves, decided that perhaps this plate itself could become something that had voice, something that served as a kind of um, median, a mediator and interlocutor that would kind of bridge a gap of time. So we outfitted the bottom side of this of this uh, mattress with 12 bone conductors, much larger than the ones on the coral um, necklace, to vibrate and play essentially um, a recording of the Kumalipo as recorded by Josh Tengen seen previously. Next slide, please. And so the mattress itself, this fossil plate, uh, basically vibrates at the frequency of the stone and Josh's voice uh, uh, tuned in such a way and mixed in such a way that the stone itself is actually vibrating. So there is a kind of inaudible frequency or signal going through the stone that is then completed only when your body or your skull is placed against its surface. So when you lie on it or put your skull on it, the sound is felt and the text is completed and made legible um, using your body as a conduit. Next slide, please. And so um, this grouping of objects alongside of the historical um, holding from the collection that you see up in the kind of right side on the wall, um, mounted on the wall is the um, kappa cloth, um, the bed at center, the volcanic latrine on the left, and to the right, a series of fallen palm tree fragments uh, that were outside of the museum that were cut down and fell when they were in, uh, encroaching on another person's uh, property. Um, next slide, please. And so this kind of circuit to me of land and sea references of sound and history, past and present, were, I guess, the blueprint in many ways for for a pathway created in this installation. Next slide, please. The palm tree itself played the digital delay echo of the um, coral necklace through its palm uh, trunks up to the end of, you know, in a kind of reverberating pattern. So the coral necklace would begin the Hawaiian chant of the Kumalipo and it would be picked up digitally as an echo in the uh, palm tree fragments and travel along the trunk components um, with a kind of algorithmic delay. So it was never quite the same all the time. It was always kind of responsive to the next state and it's kind of looping pattern. Next slide, please. A couple of installation images. The bone conductor, the larger ones you can see there is a silver. Um, entities or silver objects. They look like uh, small stethoscopes. Next slide, please. The tubules themselves of the palm tree, the water that uptake the water are really fascinating to me. And um, beautiful forms, again, generated by nature, but that were all about conduction and transport. And again, this passage of water and the palm trees were very interesting or important to me in that way as the kind of representative of biodiversity in that they took from the water given by the land, by the water cycle upwards to nourish the biodiversity and nourish the plant itself that again would refeed its own contribution back into the cycle. In this case, transporting symbolically sound. Next slide, please. And here I wanted to just share a couple of um, images that are, they're, you know, forgive their quality, but uh, to get a sense of how these objects are in space um, with the qualifier that the sound you hear is really just the shadow of the experiential sound as is, you know, as are these images of the, the experience of the piece. But, but nonetheless, could you play that for us, please? 
So this sound that you hear is actually, there are no speakers. This sound is actually the bone conductors turning the entire trunk with its tubule fibers and its kind of hollowness into an echoing sound chamber. The speaker you see at the end, really briefly there, is the only speaker in the entire exhibition and it's connected to a recording from a live cam uh, in a coral reef uh, set up by the Megalab which is a collective that's part of the UH um, Hawaii Hilo uh, recording um, um, uh, biodiversity in the ocean. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? And here's a quick um, shot of the uh, video shot of the coral necklace in action of it. Uh, could you play that, please? Just to give you a sense of its suspension. <laughs> and more for its placement. Next slide, please. I think I'll close with this image again, of the circuit kind of being completed in many ways. And that's all the images I want to share with you. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Michael. There's, there are always um, um, many layers of um, ideas incorporated into your work. Um, let me start just a bit with process. Um, you mentioned that it's a highly collaborative process, not only um, in terms of production, but also um, as you incorporate or examine different scientific processes that then become a part of your um, artistic process. So I imagine that uh, that involves a lot of um, working with um, different collaborators. So um, if you could just elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the collaborative is in a way, a way the you know, biggest you know, extension and you know evolution in my own practice. I've always collaborated with other uh, people in fields to do the work I do. You know, to do the research, to kind of learn from expertise about processes, um, about knowledge and information, this kind of sharing. I think that you know collaboration is really only a kind of formal way to or way to formalize the kind of concept of sharing in a sense and of disseminating and and kind of um, collectively um, creating you know, new knowledge pools. So collaboration though in, in the arena of sculpture, I thought maybe through also kind of through the period of COVID became something that was really, really important. If I couldn't move my hands in one place, perhaps they could be moved in another. And I think we all kind of learned, learned that that's another form of a, a kind of not, not human prosthesis, but chain almost of action. And that really struck a chord. And so I thought, well, with all the collaboration I've already done and the kind of incredible generosity of, uh, of, of spirit and knowledge and information sharing that I've had from scientists and um, craftsmen and experts in fabrication and um, et cetera, you know, um, uh, perhaps we could be, make this a more direct engagement in the, the collaboration itself, which brings new perspective continually, could be a, a, in a way a real-time version of what happens in an art practice, you know, which to me is over a number of pieces of work or bodies of work, which I think is you know, of utmost importance over the individual work itself. Perhaps since in this chain of time where one body of work usually kind of breeds you know, new ideas and new information and new places to explore maybe this could also happen in real time within the practice by collab by collaborating more um, explicitly with others and um, the core the nft project uh, organic growth crystal reef is a really to me a, a fantastic example of that and a very um, continually lesson giving example of, of such a collaboration where 
you know, people coming from completely different uh, making spheres and different language spheres almost of creating um, or trying to find a common language in order to, and communicate to another group and expand an audience beyond uh, uh, necessarily a particularly exclusively art audience or an exclusively um, a science audience or, or, or digital art audience, but or crypto audience, you know, but rather kind of create and try to bridge gaps between all communities. It, it I does think seem collaborative that's possible. Sorry. Um, but it does seem that um, in a way, as technology evolves, your your um, the, the collaborative mode of your practice has amplified right? from your earlier works to over 10,000 participants in your um, current project. Um, so that, 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 as you say, this kind of um, expanding your network of collaboration and now incorporating voices from different sectors, um, different contexts um, certainly has grown. Uh, and is it perhaps, is it safe to say that that has definitely evolved in the way that you approach your objects and the way you present your objects? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a great example of that. I think that um, you know, these things happen kind of organically as well. And I, I think that really that kind of idea of the technology um, expanding scale, reaching and communicating beyond its physical um, kind of immediacy, which of which I, as a sculptor, you know, um, truly hold as, as significant and you know, the experience of the artwork, which for me is, is, is incredibly prime, primary. And um, that what we see and discuss is uh, secondary to the work and experience of the artwork itself. So, you know, working in something digital, um, the real challenge was to kind of extend that um, kind of primacy and in some ways the intimacy of the digital screen and NFT perhaps if you will in this case um, are one form of primacy if they're not experiential then what are they and perhaps by taking everyone collectively through this process of growth and participation and viewership and and then again participation um, maybe that going through this experience together where everyone has a stake in it and everyone has invested, um, not just monetarily, but in terms of time and content. Um, maybe this is a way to, to, to kind of talk about that primacy as well, you know, that, that experience. Maybe the experience itself isn't just the encounter. Maybe the experience can be by the journey through the process. And in many ways, I think technology is, you know, as in my interest in it has always done that in a sense. It's like, how do we use technology, which is always in our minds, you know, looking at something that's moving forward to look at our past and also to bring us closer to things that we you know, can't access, not, but not by um, purely scientific or, um, you know, means determined by you know, the natural world. Maybe we can become closer by histories, by stories, by empathy, by commonality. That's what, um, I think that is uh, the most sort of salient characteristic of your work. As you say, you are first and foremost a sculptor, that um, the multi-sensorial um, aspect, the, the, as you put it, the primacy of that physical encounter and the experience and even the physical investment, not only in creating the work, but in um, experiencing your work. Um, they are, uh, you know, as, as we've gone through the different projects, they certainly draw from a particular site specificity. How do you see um, an installation like the one in Hawaii in a different space? Have you, um, in other words, it's, it's so embedded in its locale and perhaps speaking to an audience uh, or at least part of that audience who is connected in a very different way to those works. Um, how do you approach representing that work as it were uh, in a different context? Um, similar I, I think, specific works. 
similar size, but how do they transport or transpose yeah. or live in other contexts? Or do they live in other contexts? Do you yeah, I think that, you know, in many ways, this was very specific to potentially the, you know, the side of the museum, but I also see the museum and its address of, you know, the taxonomies or the, the structures uh, of, and frameworks that we'd look to and find in a place like a natural history museum as, you know, echoed. So kind of using the strategies of the museum to not, to, not, not turn in on themselves subversively, but to you know kind of take a different pathway um, is interesting. But that's that again, I think is also just a creative springboard, as is the content um, potentially within the piece. I would hope that, for instance, using the Kumalipo itself has more resonance in Hawaii, but that it's kind of perhaps transposition would almost serve as an arc or you know diplomatic shuttle somewhere else, because after all, it is a it is a narrative. Uh, a creation narrative and it's it is a sound sound, sound um escape in this case and experience that is native to the place and um but that is also potentially something that i think you know, could be experienced or shared elsewhere though it might you know have to have a slightly different context uh, specified mm. for how to how to show it i don't think all all works can transpose um and of these works, perhaps the most challenging one to move would be the um, would be the bed itself, and along with its the content of its sound. But I think that the history itself is contained within the piece. So from that kind of origin story, um, as related to the framework um, and its particular uh, object identity. Um, the, uh, the kind of history of the bed itself and the fact that it's missing its local time and the fact that it's at the same from the same time as you know kind of the historical narrative um, and that the thing that you lie on is again the the kind of um, a, a traveled but uh, geologic past that's been kind of used as a conduit to access something even beyond time which is that creation narrative Mm. all these levels of time i think i hope would override but again until it's experienced it might be hard to hard to tell that is um it's certainly across the the materials that you choose um the 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 layers of time that you make manifest from the geologic from 500 million years ago um all the way to the president, uh, to the uh, present with uh, the digital technology. Um, unbelievably, we just have a few minutes left. So perhaps I will look to the future and just ask you um, what you have coming up, what you've got planned, what's next on your, um, 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 the next sort of stage in the process of evolving existing objects or perhaps the future of your fossils, the remaining fossil remnants, um, um, well, future projects. Yeah, I'm working on a, currently I'm working on a, um, a com commission uh, for um, an outdoor place in England for a new foundation and I'll be working on a number of other um, projects uh, involving um, outdoor works and included it, uh, I guess, among them uh, is the evolution of the NFT project and the evolution of the organic reef. Um, so hopefully this kind of continuing the, the progress of something from uh, the digital sphere into real life is, mm -hmm. is important to me. Um, the reef itself, um, I'm hoping that we'll be showing it uh, publicly at a public institution soon and and I've begun um, forays uh, along uh, with initial research into sites potentially to continue that progress uh, potentially beyond the institution and back into its inspiration source which is um, the sea itself. Now um, sorry maybe just one more question if I can um, <laughs> If you don't mind my asking, there's another loop, sort of um, um, another cycle, uh, sort of closing. Are you foreseeing combining your work with silver nitrate and 
the NFTs? Uh, yes, potentially. And I'll have to see how that how that how that leads now that we've ta we're tackling and learning and beginning to get you know absorbed and involved with with these kinds of transitions and the way that the speed of this process works. It'll be um, you know, it's funny what you you mentioned the silver nitrate. So, um, I just done a number of um, uh, video works and connected to some kind of uh, uh, music projects that involve silver nitrate. So extending the silver nitrate process into different um, kind of, I guess, contextual lenses to mm -hmm. see and, and watch that process unfold um, is definitely um, in the cards. The silver nitrate process for me is always about, you know, a real chemical process coming together as whose origins for us are in image making. But for me to kind of privilege the, um, you know, to kind of, you know, be informed by that image making history, but to utilize the fact of its chemical transformation and its detectability by us in other ways to kind of say, well, let's start with the image, but let's go beyond it. What can we see inside of this? Um, I know that you know, as usual, we could go on for a long time talking um, about the different works, but um, um, there's certainly more to come. And this certainly won't be the last time that we speak um, or that we encounter your work. Um, but um, as we come to the end of this particular se session, um, I would like to thank you very much, Michael, for joining us. Um, it was fascinating to um, follow your more recent installation. Um, taking us at least virtually to the beautiful landscape of Hawaii. Um, I am grateful also to my colleagues, Mary Mulcahy, Grace Murray, Demi Mohammed, and Andy Finch for making possible this evening's event. To our audience, we are so glad you could join us and hope to see you again soon. So um, please visit the site, uh, see the other artists talks, um, other artists that engage with um, different histories and um, the museum's collections. Um, and um, please uh, stay tuned for future programs, updates on future programming. Thank you and good evening.